Millions of people died in the Second World War, many of them in concentration camps. Today, the story of two survivors told by their daughter, Rosalind Franken, who has written a great new book called Meant to Be. Welcome to the studio, Rosalind. Thank you. John and Sonia Franken were your parents. They have an extraordinary story to tell and you've told it for them. Let's start with who were they and their story in the concentration camps. Well, my mother was born on February 6, 1926 in a small town in the Netherlands. And at age 15 was literally taken from her home by the Nazis, forced from her home and taken to the first of a series of concentration camps and was in Auschwitz and Reichenbach and a camp in the Netherlands called Camp Furt and experienced things that we can't even imagine horrors of, of what she went through, loss of her parents and her brothers and her sister, and not knowing from one day to the next if she's going to see another day, basically, and starved and, and, and terrible, terrible treatment and things. And she actually faced death in the gas chambers three times and survived. And my father was born on April 10, 1922, and he was born on the island of Samarang in the former Dutch East Indies, now known as Indonesia. And he was drafted into the Dutch Navy Air Force and he was captured by the Japanese and was a prisoner of war for three and a half years. And he survived the Nagasaki atomic bomb. I want to talk about their stories in more detail. Um, the name of your book is meant to be. Those are extraordinary words, there are only three words. Yes. But they are extraordinary when you think of what your parents went through. How could it be meant to be? What they went through, the fact that they survived, you look at these two people who were prisoners on opposite sides of the world, who were forced to live and work as slave laborers in the most horrendous of living conditions. And when you hear the stories of things that they survived and how they survived, and then how they were able to meet and come together and marry and make a beautiful life in Montreal, Canada. You can't help but wonder like, how could this, how could this be? And you look at it and you think it had to be meant to be. And my parents used that expression so many times of things that would happen that, that it had to be the title of my book because they were meant to be. And I feel that I'm doing what I'm doing now because this is what I am meant to be doing to carry their story forwards, not just of what they survived and how they survived, but how could these people have been such positive, high-spirited people, good people after all that they suffered and all the, the worst of humanity that they both saw and experienced to me is, is a miracle that was meant to be. Cruelty would be a word I think that would be very suitable mm -hmm. given what your, your parents have gone through, had gone through. Um, let's just talk a little bit about that as difficult as it might be. Your mother's experiences you write in the book uh, in one case where she's working essentially in a manufacturing plant, radios, and she's accused of trying to sabotage a radio and she stands up to a Nazi soldier. Tell me that story. Well, this Nazi soldier just decided to put a, a gun to my mother's head. Imagine he had a gun right to her head and accuses her of sabotaging one of the radios. And she's all of 15 years old, right? And she basically refused to admit to something that she didn't do. And he, he was like a bully, really essence of a bully. He's trying to push her and get her to admit to it. And she stood right up to him and stood right into his face and said, you want to shoot me? Then shoot me, because I'll tell you again and again that I didn't do it. And then he turned around and he shot dead the girl who he knew did it all along and turns to my mother and basically laughed. He laughed and said, I just wanted to see how far I could push you. It was all some sort of game. That was fun for him. And my mother was convinced that, that if she didn't do what she did, or if she would have shown her fear, he would have shot her dead too. One of the things that, you know, that war criminals, uh, sorry, not war criminals, but war criminals, what they did in these concentration camps to the victims was dehumanizing them. Your mother went through that as well. 
Well, the, the worst part of, of it, and, and I remember reading about this, that they actually called it the dehumanization process when she was registered with a, a tattooed number on her arm. And um, her sister, her older sister, actually had the tattoo removed. And my mother was once asked in an interview about her wartime experiences, you know, why didn't she remove it? And she said, there's no way I would remove it because she said that tells people that this really happened. Because nothing frustrated my mother more than hearing from these Holocaust deniers who say that none of this ever happened. You can just imagine. But talk about, like you say, dehumanization where you're not even, you don't even have a name anymore. You're a number. And living in deplorable conditions. As you said, starvation. Uh, your mother had an angelic voice. Beautiful yes, singer. She did. It may have saved her life in one of those camps one night. Yes, yes. Uh, again, she would tell you it was meant to be because she was brave enough, first of all, to actually sing the, the prayers over the candles, the, the Sabbath candles. And it was uplifting for everybody to have that experience, to have my mother do that. And there was a guard, a Nazi guard, who overheard her singing and basically said afterwards, it's a good thing she had such a beautiful voice. He was so taken, still taken by her beautiful voice that he let her live, because otherwise they, wouldn't, they don't want people singing, doing something like that. So it was, again, meant to be. Uh, one more story about your mother, and then I want to talk about your father, John. Uh, they were twins, and unfortunately, the Nazis often did experiments medical experiments with people, twins being one of them. Your mother had a horrific experience seeing what happened to those twins and then saved the lives of a pair of twins. She saved the lives of a pair of twins because by that time my mother, as you said, knew what would happen to these little girls that one morning there were these, this, this mother with uh, these little girls in, at morning roll call where the prisoners are counted and there were new prisoners there and she saw these little girls and she couldn't stand the thought of what's going to happen to them because they would be going to, the, the name of the doctor was Dr. Mengele. He's, the name is well known. He was known as the angel of death for the horrific, horrific medical experiments that he did on identical twins. And my mother basically, when the guard wasn't looking, took one of the little girls and ran her to far enough away so that so that they wouldn't be seen side by side. She pleaded with the mother saying, you can't leave these girls side by side because it would be too obvious. My mother said these girls were not just identical. I mean, they were beautiful little girls, but you could not tell them apart. And for sure they would be taken. They would be like prime candidates for, for Dr. Mengele. So, but that mother didn't know what to do. She, she froze, she, she not even panicked, she just froze. And my mother said, I, I had to do it right in that moment. My mother just acted, and that, that was an incredible act of courage that she did. And she said everybody who was watching, who must have seen when the guard wasn't looking, the fact that he, he didn't even see her do it, that she got back to her place just in time, again, you know, it meant to be that my mother had that courage and that for whatever reason, these little girls were meant to live. It's extraordinary, given how young your mother was, uh, for her to go through what she did and to be able to make such brave decisions. Yes. Which obviously put her own life in peril is, is as you would say, meant to be remarkable. Absolutely, absolutely. Your father was in a different part of the world, but he too was a prisoner of war. And when he was taken prisoner of war, he had some close calls. One of them is a story about an outhouse. <laughs> and that is thank a good goodness he got out of it in time. He got out of it just in time. I mean, he literally, um, how else to say it, but was doing his thing in the outhouse and the bombing started. And he had, he, he had just enough time to basically get out of there. And he said it was a long row of outhouses. And right where he was sitting just moments earlier got completely bombed and obliterated. And, and had, I mean, it was just seconds of, of whatever you want to call it, that allowed him to escape death in that moment. Uh, uh, again, one of many stories of things that happened that 
saved his life. He had a series of close calls. Uh, at one point, he could have lost at least his foot and potentially could have been hit on the head with a heavy piece of metal that would have killed him. What is that story? That was where they um, had these huge pieces of metal because he was uh, in the shipbuilding, working as a slave la laborer building ships. And they had these huge sheets of metal, heavy, heavy metal that were held up by a crane. And the crane gave way, basically, and the, the piece of metal just came right down and just missed his foot by... Inches. Like, not even inches. He said it was like right there. It just, it, he said he felt it touch his hat. Like, it, 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 it's astonishing that, that, again, he would have lost his foot. And the story of him being in Nagasaki when the first atomic bomb was dropped, um, the second by the Americans, to end the Second World War, essentially, he was underground by choice in a coal mine, yes. which was really about getting to be able to bathe on a daily basis. I know. Usually when I, when I do my speaking and my presentations, I ask the audience, why do, you, why do you think he would volunteer to work in the coal mines? It's one of the most dangerous jobs you can ever think of. So everybody thinks because it would be warmer because that was one of the, the, the challenges he faced was the cold. It's very cold, and cold winters in Nagasaki that we can relate to in Ottawa, right? Mm -hmm. But my father uh, had never experienced winter, so it was very difficult for him. But he said, no, what motivated him was the fact that when you work in the coal mines, he'd heard that you get a bath every day as opposed to maybe a bath every 10 days when you work in the shipyards. And uh, that was his motivation, was just personal hygiene is what I call it. So it's a good thing that, that he did that because uh, he, d he volunteered to work in the coal mines. It was about three months before the bomb was dropped. So where was he when the bomb fell on Nagasaki? It was hundreds of meters underground. It saved his life. When he came to the surface, the devastation must have been unbelievable from that atomic bomb. Did he talk about that with you? He talked about it uh, a little bit. There was, he said there was nothing. Everything was, was absolutely flattened. But what really stuck in my mind is when the Americans came and liberated his camp and they took him to, by train to, to Okinawa, he said he could literally see bodies like floating, you know, and, and, and he saw death, he saw um, destruction, he saw there was nothing left. You know, barely a building standing. It, 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 again, things that we can't even imagine. When we come back, after John and Sonia experience the horrors of war in concentration camps, they find love and move to Montreal, Canada. We'll be back in conversation with Rosalind Franken in just a moment. <laughs> 